seconds. Just a few minutes late. <laughs> Just a few minutes late. Here we go. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's uh, Mike Wiesner um, and uh, Scott Roberts, and I'm here to introduce Mike. If you don't already know him, uh, uh, Mike has been in the amateur astronomy community since I guess he was six years old. I mean, he's been he's been doing amateur astronomy for a long time. Uh, he um, um, he uh, went on to uh, become a pilot. He was a jet fighter pilot. He studied astrophysics. He has a bachelor of science in astrophysics. He's uh, um, you know, fantastic amateur astronomer. He's an author. Uh, he wrote books on how to use a very popular telescope called the Mead ETX telescope. And, uh, um, and then he started one of the very early um, uh, user communities in the amateur astronomy world called the Mighty ETX website, which I think you've just updated recently. It was kind of uh, an archive, yes. and, then, and then you've just decided to start updating it with new articles, which is awesome. Um, and uh, Mike is also uh, uh, instrumental in uh, reviewing cases for dark sky sites with the International Dark Sky uh, Association. And uh, you are a dark sky advocate, which is uh, very cool. You did a little uh, talk with us, uh, what, a week or so ago about this and right. so, uh, for International Dark Sky Week. And, uh, so, uh, Mike, I think one of the things that's really cool about Mike's contributions to uh, the amateur astronomy world is not only is it, he's a champion for dark skies, uh, but uh, he takes uh, projects that are very affordable for most people in the amateur, uh, in the amateur astronomy world. Uh, he started with the small telescope called the ETX, which is wildly popular. Uh, and he still has thousands and thousands of ETX groupies that follow him. Um, but uh, now he's taking us into the world of astrophotography with just your smartphone. Okay, so how many people have smartphones? Almost everyone. Okay, so uh, and Mike will talk about uh, how you can make astrophotographs with your smartphone using a couple of different apps that are out there. There are special adapters and holders for smartphones, for telescopes. Um, when I take people to Mount Wilson to show them views to the 60 inch telescope, you'll often see them holding their smartphones in front of the eyepiece uh, doing, they, maybe they don't even know what it's called, but it's called a focal projection. And they're projecting the image comes through the eyepiece through the iPhone, you know, sharpening it up, zooming in on it and taking those images. And some of the images are really remarkable. But beyond taking images of the moon and planets, you know, when you get into something that's faint, like a galaxy or a nebula, that's where it gets tricky, you know. And here's, uh, and so Mike can take it away from here. Well, thank you, Scott. Uh, it's great to be back online with you. Uh, just a little bit of background on this presentation. It was originally scheduled uh, to be given at the second annual David H. Levy Arizona Dark Sky Star Party at Kirshner Caverns here in Arizona next month. But when that got canceled, uh, I was disappointed because I really wanted to help get the word out about doing smartphone astrophotography. And Scott said, hey, why don't we do this on live, uh, online and do it live? And so I'm thrilled to be able to let you all see what you can do with a smartphone. It's pretty incredible. So, but first a little disclaimer that I want to give everybody. Uh, I like to say that I just play at doing astrophotography. I don't have the $3,000 uh, imager, CCD imager cameras. Uh, I do a lot of digital SLR astrophotography, but I also do this uh, astrophotography with an iPhone, and I've been doing that for a while. Um, so I, I tell everybody I just play at astrophotography. I don't spend hours and hours and hours capturing photons from one object, and then I don't spend hours and hours post-processing those in images to try to get the best data out of it. And I generally don't stack individual images. But as you'll see, I do get some pretty amazing results. Uh, I'll be showing you just the smartphone stuff today. 
So very briefly, let's talk about the types of astrophotography um, that you can do. You have your simple night sky astrophotography. You just hold the phone and up, camera up towards the sky, and you take a picture of whatever you see. Sometimes with some apps that'll work, sometimes it won't. You can also mount your camera, you mount your, mount your smartphone on your telescope or on a tracking mount, and, and you can do track sky astrophotography. There's another type of astrophotography that we call prime focus astrophotography. Does not really apply to doing astrophotography with a smartphone because in order to do prime focus astrophotography, you have to take the lens off. And most people are not going to pry off the, the lens off of their $1,000 smartphone. A focal astrophotography, which Scott mentioned earlier with the Mount Wilson telescope, that's when you see what look through the eyepiece, you'll see what you're going to see, and then you hold the camera up over the eyepiece and let the camera see what you saw through the eyepiece. And then we also have eyepiece projection as to photography. Again, does not apply to smartphone because you can't pull the lens off. So most of the sky photography that you will all be doing will be some sort of sky photography or the afocal astrophotography. <clears throat> so early smartphone astrophotography. Well, as it turns out, I was not the first person to use a phone camera for astrophotography. My old ETX site had several submissions that were taken of the moon with the early uh, cell phones that, that started coming out with cameras back in the early 2000s. And, you know, for a bright object like the moon, that worked out pretty well. Steve Jobs, the Apple CEO at the time, unveiled, unveiled the original iPhone in January 2007. And I think I actually did then the first Apple iPhone astrophotograph that you see here on the right on Christmas Eve 2007, afocally with an ETX 70 millimeter refractor and a nine millimeter eyepiece giving about 40 power. And it's just a handheld picture of the moon. So I think that was probably the very first iPhone astrophotograph. If somebody knows different, please let me know. <laughs> Over the years, I've continued to do lots of iPhone astrophotography with different telescopes, binoculars, clip-on telephoto lenses, and, of course, ever-improving iPhone models. You can also do terrestrial photography through telescopes or spotting scopes, binoculars, night scopes. I've done a little bit of playing with night scopes. It's kind of cool to put your, put, your phone, <clears throat> excuse me, put your phone on a night scope and get some pictures. And, of course, there's lots of the clip-on lenses that are available, wide angles and long telephoto lenses that you can put on a smartphone. And and so you can do some pretty cool stuff with those lenses. So how do you get started? Well, the easiest way to get started with smartphone astrophotography is, is like Scott said, just hand hold the smartphone over, camera over your eyepiece. That's going to be limited to the brighter object, just like the moon and the planets, because you need to keep the shutter speed fast. It's also challenging to keep your camera aligned properly over the eyepiece. Uh, it gets a little bit difficult to try to you know, keep your hands still and keep everything centered up. Uh, so that's a bit of a challenge. It's also difficult to avoid blurring due to that camera movement, especially if you're trying to do longer exposures on paint objects. But the basic technique is to just focus the object to your eye through the eyepiece, then hold the camera over the eyepiece. If your camera has auto exposure, try to use it. Let it do it for pictures of the moon. That works out pretty well. And then if you can adjust it if necessary and if it's possible with your app, Go ahead and maybe dim down the brightness or something like that, and then take the photograph. So here are a couple of examples of handheld astrophotography. We've got Venus, a nice crescent Venus on the left, and the Galilean moons on the right. A bright Jupiter overexposed so that I could bring out the four individual Galilean moons. So for something that's really bright, like Venus, especially right now with the Venus approaching a very nice crescent phase, uh, or Jupiter, you can do some pretty nice handheld photographs. Come on, change there. Whoops, back up. You, oh, stop, stop. Sorry about all that. <laughs> come on, come on. PowerPoint went berserk on me. Come on. Ah, geez. Boy, Scott, everything's going wrong for us today. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on a second here. I'm not letting we had see. Some... I, I stopped letting him see <laughs> the, the, uh, the uh, uh, missed uh, slide there. So oh, Okay. All righty. So here we go. Here we go. So crescent moon, a nice, very thin crescent moon, you know, through the eyepiece. Um, there on the left, a, a little larger crescent moon in the middle. And, of course, you can take craters on the moon. That's Clavius crater okay. that you see there. Pretty right. good. This is all. So that's pretty, that's pretty big iphone astrophotography right 
Yep, yep. Just simple iPhone astrophotography. Um, nothing major going on with these pictures. Mm-hmm. Easy to do, bright stuff, handheld. Here's uh, total solar eclipse pictures from August of 2017. Mm-hmm. Picture on the left was taken with an eight power clip on telephoto lens with a solar filter. Uh, there's actually a company that was selling uh, the eight power telephoto lenses with a little solar filter that fit over the lens. That's cool. So that's what the partial phase looked like. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, totality on the right. All right. But the best way to do smartphone astrophotography is to physically mount the smartphone on the eyepiece. There's lots of adapters that are out there. Uh, they range from about $20 up to $100 or so. Cool. Most of the adapters are universal. They support a wide range of phone sizes and position of the camera on the back of the phone. But there are some that are specific to certain iPhone, certain smartphone models, sizes, and camera locations. So if you're purchasing one of those, be certain you get the one that matches your phone. Some of them will actually work with spotting scopes and binoculars. Spotting scopes and binoculars tend to have some odd size eyepieces. Uh, so again, you want to be certain it'll work with your particular equipment. But with hand, as with handheld imaging, initially getting the camera aligned over the eyepiece can be a challenge, especially on dark objects. But I'll show you some tricks for that. So very briefly about some smartphone adapters that are out there. This is one from several years ago from Orion. This particular model has been discontinued. Mike, but it's typical. Yeah. Let's hold just a moment because we said some, somebody said we lost the video feed. Uh uh, and somebody says working fine for me. So we're good. Okay. We're still. Fine. Okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We were going to have a temporary. <laughs> but okay. Okay. So this particular model has been discontinued, but it's typical of what you can find uh, in many places from the typical telescope dealers or online at various stores. Uh, it's got several axes, several adjustments that you can make. Uh, it's typically going to work with almost any smartphones. Uh, they typically also only support the one and a quarter inch eyepieces up to some certain diameter of the eyepiece too. Most of these types of adapters do not have a tripod mounting hole, but if there are openings on various pieces of the bracket, you might be able to still attach it to a tripod uh, with a little wing nut. And, and I have one right here. This one, this one's from Explore Scientific. It uses suction cups to hold it on. It works with an most inch and a quarter eyepieces, and it's fifteen bucks. Okay. There, there's the uh, okay. there's the unabashed uh, <laughs> plug for our product. <laughs> and I will touch on that one in just a bit. Um, <laughs> the Eleven Hook smartphone adapter. Uh, sorry, Scott. It's actually nope. my oh. favorite smartphone oh, that's adapter. That's a good one. It is really nice. It's inexpensive. Uh, it supports the small little 0.65 inch eyepieces, as you'll see in a minute, or actually in a few minutes when I do a demo. Uh, it supports the one and a half inch eyepieces, and it even goes all the way up to two inches. I'll do some demoing of, of different eyepieces with us at the end of the talk. Uh, so it's very flexible. Uh, it fits most smartphone models. Uh, it has a tripod mounting hole. So here you can see various pictures of the 11 hook adapter being used on various telescopes, of binoculars, just on a tripod or hand holding uh, an eight par binocular uh, through uh, taking a picture of something very long distance. If you can see down at the bottom uh, on the right hand side, uh, my observatory, I'm actually pointed at Kid Peak Observatory which is 65 miles away from me. And the picture on, in the lower right-hand corner is actually what the iPhone saw of Kitt Peak 65 miles away. And if you look at the very right edge of the, of the top of the mountain where it's flat, you might be able to see a little bump there. That's the Mayall four-meter telescope dome sticking up. Cool. So uh, try doing that with just your typical you know, smartphone camera, but doing them hooking it up to a, a monocular or binocular or telescope, you can really bring in the long distance views very nicely. Very nice adapter. Mead has an adapter, um, supports one and a quarter inch eyepieces. As you can see here, it, it actually holds very nicely to the eyepiece because it's got three screws uh, that tighten down on the eyepiece. So it gives you a pretty good sense of security, but there's no tripod mounting hole. Fortunately, it does support most smartphone models. And here's that Explorer Scientific adapter that um, Scott was talking about. It uses suction cups. 
Um, there is no tripod mounting hole, but it obviously will support all kinds of uh, smartphones. So the, my only concern with this one was if, as your telescope is flowing around, Scott, yeah. uh, and so if you're up, if you're going to be upside down with the eyepieces, yeah. the phone going to be still held securely. Uh, you know, I mean, this, that's upside down, but uh, we have actually there's like a little strap that goes on it. Um, having something that could grab it from the side would be more secure, but it kind of limits which uh, cameras you might be able to use. Yes. Yeah. True statement. True statement. So uh, this again, you know, it's a nice one for many uses. So certainly can you be recommended. Explore Scientific. Come on, change my slide. Also has another one they sell from Bresser. A little bit more uh, fancy to this one. Uh, it supports again the one quarter inch eyepieces. Uh, the specs, and I'm not tested these last two here. Mm -hmm. um, it, it supposedly attaches to the eyepiece holder, not the eyepiece itself. But it does look like it can still attached to an eyepiece yeah, up to about a 68 go straight yeah. to the eyepiece and, and level yeah. off the camera because having it angled like that would make one side look sharper than the other. So, yeah, yeah. Right. So, so as I note here, the, uh, there's something wrong with this picture in, in, on the website because it, the phone is angled. So it's actually looking into the side of the eyepiece, not straight through. Uh, but this one can be a very nice one. It's going to be very good and secure on the, on the telescope. Yes. And again, it's going to support lots of different iPhone models. So, so that can be a good one for people. This particular one from PhoneScope called the Digiscoping Adapter uh, supports one and a half inch eyepieces and two inch eyepieces. Oh, wow. There are uh, adapters available for binoculars and spotting scopes and rifle scopes. They sell all kinds of adapters. There's also an optional tripod mounting adapter. The bummer is that you need a specific case for your model and size of iPhone because where the adapter for the eyepiece is, is fixed. It does not move around. So that's why you need a specific case. But because it's fixed directly over the camera, there is no optical alignment challenge. Uh, it, the camera on your smartphone will always be aligned to the eyepiece. And I'll demo that in a little bit. Uh, but again, you can see how it mounts to just about anything that's got an eyepiece on it. This particular picture down on the mountain on the lower right-hand corner was taken through a 12 by 50 binocular with the iPhone mounted on it. That particular mountain, Picacho Peak, kind of famous here in Arizona, is 31 miles away from me. And yet you can see how nicely detailed the picture is on the right. Um, so uh, pretty, pretty nice adapter. Not bad. So let's look at some examples of iPhone astrophotography, afocal astrophotography, and then we'll get into more specifics about how they were taken. So here's the moon. I love seeing and photographing all the mountain shadows on, along the Terminator. And with something like a smartphone, you can actually get some very nice detailed pictures uh, that will show you just those really nice sharp mountain peak shadows. And of course, you can do craters. Uh, this is Copernicus Crater. You can do sunspots if you have a good a proper solar filter. And you can even do asteroids. So here, or I should say dwarf planet in this case, um, series. Uh, this was done with an older iPhone a few, several years ago. But, you know, that's the asteroid series. Of course, Venus, uh, again, a gibbous face here. Saturn, single shot picture of Saturn uh, with an iPhone. You see Cassini's division in there very nicely. You can see the shadow. Uh, if you're looking at me on a, on a large screen right now, you can see the shadow of the planet out onto the rings. So a pretty detailed picture for a smartphone. A uh, transit of the sun by the Chinese space station uh, back in 2013. Um, you see a lot of pictures of people uh, that have taken uh, the International Space Station crossing the sun or the moon. Uh, and you can actually see some of the structures, solar panels and whatnot on the space station when it's crossing uh, the moon or the sun. Uh, the, the Chinese space station was way smaller than the International Space Station, so it just shows up as a dot. But there it is, crossing the, the surface of the sun, the disk of the sun. Stars, double cluster, low power, wide angle eyepiece. You can get both clusters in there and you can get a picture of it. Alberio, notice the colors, both the blue and the gold color. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, pretty impressive for a smartphone uh, that you can bring out colors like that. Yeah. 
Globular clusters, uh, the large globular clusters, the bright globular clusters are easy to do with a smartphone. We've got Hercules globular cluster on the left and M22 on the right. Um, pretty easy to do globular clusters. But it gets a little bit more challenging with things like nebulae, planetary nebulae. So on the left, this one actually worked out a heck of a lot better than I expected. That's the blue snowball. And I have an insert there that shows a magnified view of just you know, cropped from the same image. And you can see quite a bit of the structure of the blue snowball planetary nebula. So that worked out really nice for me. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Great Nebula, every, one of everybody's favorite objects on the right hand side, M57. M57 is actually a pretty easy nebula to capture with a smartphone. How about the Swan Nebula? There, and you can actually see the swan shape, the heads on the right, the bodies there uh, going through the center. That's uh, amazing. Yeah. That's a and then amazing. Just, with a smartphone. That's on a smartphone. That's on a smartphone. Triangulum Galaxy, about a magnitude 7 galaxy, uh, kind of faint and kind of a challenge to get. So you don't see the real nice spiral arm structure with a smartphone, but you can see the, the scope of the, the, no pun intended, uh, the size of the galaxy there in the IP. So you're bringing in those spiral arms. You're just not getting, uh, um, you're not seeing the details there. Eskimo Nebula. Uh, again, wow. another one of those challenging planetary nebulas, but it can be done. Wow. Picture on the right, I'm really was very pleased with uh, open cluster and the planetary nebula that's along the same line of sight. Yeah, that's incredible. <laughs> that's it. That was it. Yeah, that would blew me away when I said, "Oh, I got the planet." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this one was kind of fun to do. Uh, Hubble's variable nebula. Uh, it's actually uh, two different views uh, through the same eyepiece. Picture on the left is using the one power normal lens of the iPhone 11 Pro Max. Picture on the right is using the two power telephoto lens. Uh, so you can get a little bit more uh, magnification by using the telephoto lens uh, on the smartphone. Now, that, but again, you can see that object is, I mean, for a lot of uh, visual observers, that's a challenge just to find, you know, so to... <laughs> To get it uh, with an iPhone is, is again, mind-blowing to me. Yeah, it is. And uh, Sky and Telescope recently had an article about, you know, over a period of time, you know, years typically, um, you can see changes in its structure. Um, so you could even capture that potentially using a smartphone. So you don't need those $3,000 imagers potentially to do something like that. Kind of cool. Whirlpool Galaxy there on the left. And this one was bright enough to actually start bringing out some of the spiral alarm structure. And of course, you can see both components there of the galaxy. Uh, worked out pretty nice. And this one on the right, I just recently took a few nights ago, uh, the M87 Galaxy. And I, when I did a little extra post-processing on the image, I can see the black hole jet coming out of the galaxy there a short little distance, about 11 o'clock in the image. Uh, that was just really mind blowing <laughs> to capture that. Faint, yeah. You can see it's it's uh it's just a, a very very faint in, in this broadcast right here. So yeah, it, tough to see. Um, it's about eleven o'clock in the image, but it's and it's right next to the, you know the the core the nucleus of the galaxy there. Yeah, um, I had captured it with like a little yeah. tick coming out there. I yeah, it's a little tick coming out of there. It almost looks like a star or something. Yes, uh, but it's elongated. Uh, I captured it with a digital SLR, and I did not expect to be able to capture it with uh, the iPhone 11 Pro Max, but I did. And I was really shocked at when I saw that. There we go. Of course, you can do comments. This was Comet Lovejoy many years ago. Uh, the picture on the right, Leo Triplet Galaxies, low power, wide angle uh, field of view. Capture all three galaxies, M65, M66, and NGC 3628, uh, also known as Sarah's galaxy. So we captured all of those uh, galaxies of the Leo triplet with a smartphone. No! <laughs> <laughs> you have too much fun doing it. So, I do. I, do. I have fun. <laughs> Look at this it. sombrero. <laughs> Sombrero, you can see the dust lane going through. I just did this one a couple nights ago, um, and yeah, you, know, you can you can you can see structure on some of the galaxies. Yeah, sure, it's amazing with it, just with a smartphone. Anybody can do this. <laughs> That's wild. That is wild. 
This one really kind of surprised me too. Uh, the view on the, the the image on the left is a wide angle view, captures both the uh, M81 Bulls Galaxy at the bottom, M82 Seaguar Galaxy up at the top, Amazing. and then uh, a little bit more magnification on the right to just do uh, Seaguar Galaxy. And you can see the dust lane going up through the middle of it. You can see the colors there, the different colors of the galaxy. Yeah, uh, that, like, like I mean, that's that's incredible. That's incredible. It absolutely is. The um, yeah, today's smartphones are pretty doggone amazing. The original smartphones uh, were were nice, and with special software that I've been talking about, uh, you can really do bring out some of the colors and uh, the and the faint stuff. Um, but yeah, today's smartphones or cameras are pretty doggone amazing. Do of course everybody's favorite the Ryan W. Wow. Act easy to do with a smartphone uh, so put on a low power wide angle light piece and you can bring out quite a bit of detail and colors yep. just something really, uh, beautiful to look at we have a question here mike if, if you got okay it. um uh and this is from jerry hubble uh jerry wants to know how did you set the exposure time is it just default is it automatic we'll talk about that a little bit later when i get into oh. uh, some of the specifics. okay all right <laughs> I anticipated that yeah. question. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. So, uh, so most of these were done with an eight inch or twelve inch telescope, but you can use any telescope for smartphone astrophotography. A tracking mount, of course, will help, but it's not necessary for the bright objects. So let's look at some other telescope pictures. Um, this is my old e Edmund Scientific 3-inch Newtonian reflector that was a Christmas present in 1961. I still have it. You might have seen it behind me here in the video. Uh, and I used it for a particular lunar eclipse one night. Uh, with a, in that case, I think it was an iPhone 4 many years ago. Uh, but you don't need the fancy exotic telescopes to take some types of astrophotography. So next slide shows an ETX-70. Uh, thanks to Mead and other people. Uh, thanks to Scott and other people uh, when, uh, from Mead. I've gotten, I have several different ETX telescopes. Uh, but uh, this is an ETX-70. And the picture there at the top shows Dumbo Nebula. So even with a small phone on an alt as uh, tracking mount, you can still do a faint nebula. And, of course, the Andromeda Galaxy. Uh, with a wide angle low power eyepiece on an ETX 70. God, in wait. alt as, <laughs> in alt as. Okay, so that's that's amazing. That is just. In alt as, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. I'm stupefied, really. I mean, I, I'm, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, coming from, you know, the whole process of, yeah, you got to have, you know, the the better camera, you have, you know, better a science camera or something, and, and literally spending thousands of dollars. And now we just have it in our pocket. It's with us all the time you know so right yeah and you know you're not going to get the scientific quality images you're going to get fun images you're going to have something neat to show your friends and your relatives um and you know like i say i play it doing astrophotography and i have a blast doing it <laughs> yeah, that's right so here's an etx 90 this is actually the original etx uh, astro telescope uh, that i bought in 96 1996 uh, unfortunately, the drive finally gave out on that, and I mounted it onto a, an ETX EC mount that a friend of, had given me. Um, so here it is, uh, polar mounted uh, on, on a wedge, uh, taking a picture of uh, the Orion Nebula. Spectacular. ETX 125, uh, again in Altaz, a couple picture planets, Jupiter, you can actually faintly see the great red spot there. Saturn, Cassini division is visible in the picture, and Hercules globular cluster on the right. Uh, so these are just some of uh, the examples I've taken you know, with these telescopes, uh, but just to kind of give you a flavor for what you can do with the smaller telescopes. Here's a 102 millimeter refractor, out as, unguided, untracked, and no, no nothing, very basic telescope. Orion Nebula. You got the Orion Nebula. <laughs> <laughs> this has got to be, I mean, these telescopes are some of the most affordable telescopes you can buy. You get them in department stores, right? 
And you can get them at the partner store. You get them, you know, you can uh, explore scientific obviously has very affordable telescopes, me, Orion, Celestron. You got the garage sale uh, and find them for, you know, they give them away. Right. So it's, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, and yeah, so. you are, well, you, you have some in your closet, go grab it out of your closet. Start okay. taking smart exactly. exactly. Look at this. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing. Really. And, and you know, earth sign picture there, um, works out kind of neat too. Right. So the, the one other point about the, the smartphone adapter is when you have the one and a quarter inch tripod mounting hole, you can then put your smartphone on any kind of a mount. Uh, here in the middle, you can see it on one of these little flexible gorilla pods, which means you have a nice portable solution to go out and take sky astrophotography. Uh, this particular picture shows that eight inch uh, clip on telephoto, eight, eight power uh, clip on telephoto lens uh, with that solar filter adapter on the end of it wow. that I used for the, the eclipse back in 2017. On the right, you can see the, the iPhone mounted on one of these tracking mounts it just put onto a camera tripod, and it's got a little clip on lens uh, stuck onto the iPhone. So, very flexible when you have the capability with the uh, tripod mounting holes. So here are a couple of examples of just having a camera mounted on the smartphone mounted on a tripod. Uh, there's an app that will let you build up the star trail images. Uh, so this particular star trails uh, above my observatory, you see my observatory dome there at the bottom, lots of airplanes flying through the sky. So obviously this is not a recent picture because there are not a lot of airplanes in the sky right now. No. Uh, maybe I, uh, I should maybe get out and redo this picture without all these airplanes passing through. But you can also get satellites. There's a satellite kind of flaring way off on the, the left-hand side of the image. Yeah. Yeah, cool International point. Space Station rising over the observatory dome and on a partly cloudy night. Mm -hmm. uh, so, again, you just put the camera, smartphone on a tripod, tell the software to do whatever it is you want to do, and the magic happens. These are with that eight power telephoto lens, clip on lens. They were done on the tracking mouse, Sky Tracker Pro, Pleiades on the left hand side, and the Beehive cluster on the right hand side. Hmm. Uh, so, if you have very large open clusters, uh, you could capture those with one of these uh, clip on telephoto lenses. You also do full constellations without using a clip-on lens. This is the picture of Orion. The phone was actually piggybacked on an eight-inch telescope for tracking. Uh, so here we have a picture of Orion, the, the belt stars, the sword stars. Picture in the middle, if you're in a dark sky location like I am, you can even get the zodiacal light. And you can see that faintly rising up through Johnny. the middle of the picture. Yeah, uh, pretty amazing. It is. As everybody knows, zodiacal light is very faint, uh, and you do need to be at a dark location to see it after about an hour or so after sunset. Mm -hmm. But if you can see it, you can photograph it with some smartphone models and certain software. Picture on the right is actually of the constellation Andromeda, but it did capture the Andromeda galaxy, which you can see in the magnified inset up at the top. Not real sharp, but it is there. You, you did capture it. Yeah. So here's an ETX 90 with that uh, eight power clip on telephoto lens piggyback. And you can see me kind of staring through the eyepiece, doing a little handheld or guiding assistance to just the tracking mount. Uh, but again, you know, Orion Nebula with the eight power telephoto lens. Excellent. So briefly to talk about video recording. Uh, when you're imaging planets, typically uh, it can be beneficial to do a video. You can get hundreds to thousands of video frames in just a very short period of time by using 24 frames per second to even 240 frames per second. Uh, the iPhone has a slow-mo mode that will actually do 240 frames per second. Uh, you can then stack all of those frames or the best frames using stacking software on your computer, and you can end up getting a pretty nice image of the planets. There's a new app called Saturn Cam that's free for the iPhone that actually stacks the video frames on the phone. I've just started testing this app, so I don't really have much more to say about it. Uh, but uh, uh, sometime soon, I'll have a review up on my Cassiopeia Observatory website uh, to talk about Smart Cam. But so far, it looks pretty impressive. So here's some video recordings that were then stacked. Uh, 
Uh, you have Venus, a nice crescent Venus. This was some you know, almost 2,000 video frames that were stacked. Wow. Uh, a focal over 400 power. Picture of Mars, uh, quite a bit of detail there. You got clouds, you got the North Polar Cap, you got a Sirtis Major. Uh, so again, you know, you know, almost 2,000 frames at a pretty dug on high power. And with Mars opposition coming up again this summer, uh, it's going to make a great smartphone uh, target of opportunity. Yes. Come on. Okay, so here's Jupiter, a uh, much nicer bright red spot. Of course, equatorial belts coming through very nicely. Again, you know, 2,000 or so frames. And, and you know, when you're using that 240 frames per second, we're only talking about a 10-second video to get that many frames. So it's pretty nice to be able to do that. And we got Saturn there again, a nice uh, picture with the Cassini division running around the planet. A uh, little noisy just from the sharpening that was applied, but quite a bit of uh, interesting detail there. So let's talk about the apps now. So obviously the smartphones do have a camera app, um, but that camera app is going to have some limited functionality in its exposure settings and, pot and potentially even focus. The cameras typically uh, don't, the smartphone camera apps typically don't want you messing with focus. They, they think that the, the app is smarter than you are. So a lot of times it has difficulty focusing on something in the eyepiece. There is typically no intervalometer mode, so you can't take multiple pictures uh, over a period of time. And, and of course, there's no special modes for long exposures, the star trails or the satellites. But there are more capable apps for both Android and Apple smartphones. So from the Android side, of, I'm not an Android user, so I can't really talk about these, uh, but I did find on Google Play, Deep Sky Camera and Astro Cam. These do provide full exposure control, and they also do image stacking on the smartphone. From the Apple side, uh, there's this app called Nightcap Camera. It's about a three, it's a $3 app, and from my perspective, it's the most capable feature-rich app for iPhone astrophotography. It's the one that I use uh, for almost everything. I've been a tester for Nightcap Camera for many, many years. Uh, so some of the features you see in that app now are things that I've had put in uh, because that's how I wanted to use the app for astrophotography. Uh, but it's a great app. I have no qualms about recommending this guy. And it's only three dollars. Only three bucks. <laughs> Spiral Cam and Milky Cam are two apps that I've also just started testing. They're from that same developer as the Saturn Cam. They do the in, uh, on device image stacking, but they will also do star registration. So if you're on a non tracking out as mount, as the object drifts across the eyepiece field of view, Spiral Cam and Milky Cam are going to keep the image registered. So it's going to keep aligning all the stars what? so that they're not moving on your image. You don't need to be tracking. You don't need to be tracking. And and then what you can do, uh, if, if you're getting too close to the field of view, you pause the capture, recenter things back up again, and start the capture continuing. <laughs> Totally amazing. Totally amazing. Totally uh, so, that's true. And it, all, and it also does dark frames. Uh, so potentially these apps have some very great potential. But again, I've just started working with these. I really don't have much more to say about them. But again, watch Cassiope Observatory website. I'll eventually get my reviews posted. Okay. Mike, there is there is a couple of questions that came up. Maybe it's we're not too premature in asking them. But the Jupiter and Saturn shot that you showed last uh, – uh, Jerry wanted to know which telescope you were using for that. Um, this, those actually were with my 8-inch when I had my 8-inch before I upgraded to the 12-inch. To the 12. Okay. Okay. And then uh, Raymond Kwong is saying that he was hoping that, uh, uh, he says NCC, he was hoping it would support raw uh, image files. So I don't know if that's... Um, not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Okay, so hang in there, Raymond. Okay, so there you go. Well, we'll talk about the image formats here of Nightcap Camera. I'm going to run through a few slides here about Nightcap Camera, right. uh, some specifics there, because like I say, it's very powerful. It is iPhone only. There is no comparable 
app with all of its features on Android. Um, so yeah, the, the iPhone users out there, especially if you have one of the very recent model iPhones, uh, you really appreciate what you can do with Nightcap Camera. Yeah. So it provides full control over the ISO speed, the shutter speed, white balance, focus, camera lens, digital zoom, and you can even lock all the settings. Uh, so you don't have to worry about the focus changing as the camera tries to outsmart you. So this is the basic interface with a picture of the moon. You'll change the ISO, the shutter, the white balance, and the focus just using live sliders on the screen. So you touch the screen, slide your finger around, up, down, left, and right on different parts of the screen, and you'll adjust the, uh, the settings for that particular uh, feature. And, and As an ISO night, range, yeah. Nightcap camera is designed for the iPhone, correct? Yes, iPhone only. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So um, the ISO uh, range is, goes from very low to actually up very high, um, depending upon the phone model and the camera lens that you're using. The shutter speed goes from one second all the way down to a hundred thousandth of a second. Uh, so if you were doing something very bright, you could certainly obviously use a very short exposure. The older phones, uh, the sh full shutter speed is going to be a third of a second to a half second. Uh, depending upon how old the phone is, uh, the old, the very older iPhones, you can actually do a half half second. But starting with the iPhone eight, I think it was Apple uh, reduced it from a half second maximum exposure speed, shutter speed, down to a third of a second, which was a pretty significant drop uh, in how many photons you were going to capture. But now, starting with the iPhone ten, they've upped it back to one second. So you can actually capture a lot of light in that with that one second uh, shutter speed. White balance, the full range from very cool to very uh, reddish. Focus, full control over the focus range uh, and, and obviously at infinity. It also has some pretty smart artificial intelligence in the app uh, to try to give you the best quality, but you're gonna use that mostly for normal daytime photography. Um, but if you had it on a pair of binoculars, trying to take pictures of wildlife or distant scenes, uh, the auto, uh, the artificial intelligence mode can give you still some pretty nice pictures attached to one of those types of uh, devices. There's a whole slew of other enhancements. You can do this thing called light boost, which basically increases the gains on the sensor to give you uh, more faint objects. It has noise reduction built in. You can also do black and white imaging. There's all these special modes for certain types of imaging, long exposure, doing stars, doing the International Space Station, light trails, which is intended more for the terrestrial uh, car lights on the, on the streets, uh, but that's it, certainly there. And of course, the star trails and the meteors, and you, you, you tap whichever mode you want to be in here uh, down on this little pop-up pane. Now, I have a whole question. bunch of... I have a question, Mike. Uh, International Space Station, I mean... Describe to us how that even works. I mean, I, I, I will do that here shortly. Okay. <laughs> um, so a whole slew of other settings that you can play with. I'm not going to talk a lot about these. But um, the, the question about uh, the raw mode, right now, Nightcap Camera supports regular JPEG, a high-quality JPEG, and it does do TIFF. And TIFF is what I always use. Uh, to try to get the best image quality out to the file. So not full RAW, but TIFF, which is really close. <laughs> um, you can, the, the full intervalometer support here you know, is, is in the app. How many expo number of pictures you want to take, exposure time, uh, and, and what interval. So you can do this. This app can be used for taking pictures of wildflowers, you know, opening up or something like that. So it's a very flexible app. Also has a feature with this remote shutter. Uh, not all apps uh, will support a remote shutter. Um, and I'll talk more about that when I get into the demos and, and some tips later on. So let's talk about some more specifics here. So this app stacks, Im stacks images on your iPhone for the long exposure and those other special modes. For astrophotography with tracking mounts, again, there's no registration, so you need to have pretty accurate tracking, uh, you're going to use long exposure. And that's going to let you set an exposure length of seconds to minutes or hours, if you want, um, using that 
uh, half one second shutter speed. So it's going to take a one second picture. It's going to take another one second picture, one second picture, one second picture, one second picture. And then it's going to stack the all of those images together on the device. So you're going to use tripod for many of these other modes, like the space station. So the, the, the space station mode starts taking a picture of the sky. And so it's taking one of those pictures, takes another picture, another picture, another picture. And it builds up the light trail of the space station going across the sky. That is cool. Star trails are similar. Um, you actually you know, put it on the, a tripod, name this, the camera up into the sky. And you'll actually watch star trails being built up on the screen. Uh, over minutes or hours, plug the phone into a, an AC power adapter and let it run for several hours, and you'll get a pretty nice detailed Star Trail image. And it's just fun to watch it build it up live on the screen. This meteor mode is kind of fancy. It takes pictures every few seconds. It looks for streaks in the images, what? and if there's no streaks, it throws the image out. <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, how much easier can it get? So, so at the end of the night, you'll get, you know, maybe 100 images that'll have uh, visible meteors, and then you can do whatever you want with those. Uh, but you don't have, you know, thousands of images that you have to manually go through to look to see if there's a meteor there. Right. That's awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> Pretty amazing, yeah. Yeah. So the typical exposure settings, uh, somebody asked that question. So for the night sky uh, on a tripod or even a handheld, if you got a good steady hand, uh, ISO is going to be typically between 1,600 and 5,000. It's going to be you know, a second or less, or it may be seconds to hours, depending upon what you're photographing. For the moon, obviously bright phases, you're going to be uh, at a lower ISO. Uh, at the, the less bright phases, when you get down into a crescent moon thing, you may have to bump up the ISO a little bit. Shutter speed, again, depending upon phase and brightness, uh, anywhere from a 60th up to a 3,000th of a second. For planets, uh, again, usually a low ISO uh, will work, but again, uh, the shutter speed is going to depend on how bright the planet is, but one second to five hundredth of a second, uh, depending again on how bright the planet is. For stars, just you know, no nebula for just stars themselves, like that Alberio picture. ISO could be anywhere from sixteen hundred all the way up to twelve thousand five hundred. Mm. Typically, you're going to use that one second shutter speed, and then let the image build up uh, from a, a small number of seconds to maybe a minute. For the deep sky objects. Uh, M42 would be your ISO 1600 type of variety uh, for planetary nebula, for the faint galaxies. Uh, typically, you're going to be up at the max, 12,500. You're going to have it set for one second shutter speed. And I have found uh, for the faint stuff, a 60 second exposure is really sort of the, the magic point. If you go less than 60 seconds, you won't quite uh, get enough uh, images to stack up on the device. If you go beyond 60 seconds, you don't really get that much more detail uh, or, or that much more faintness brought out on the image. So almost every image of a DSO that I take of the faint ones, uh, they're all one minute long. Does require ISO 11 uh, or I iOS, I'll say it right, too many uh, same letters there, iOS 11 or later. And watch, if you have an Apple Watch, uh, you can actually do some neat stuff with the watch, uh, and that requires 3.0. It's compatible with the iPhones, the iPads, and the iPad Touch models. There is another release being worked on. Uh, hopefully, it'll be coming out soon, and it's supposed to make a lot of imaging improvements with the latest iPhone models. So if you have one of the 11s, 11 Pros, or 11 Pro Max, um, you can maybe do some even more magic with it. Mike, Apple, you, you, you mentioned, yeah. uh, you mentioned an, uh, an iWatch. Are you saying that you can use an iWatch to make astrophotographs with? Uh, well, I'm, I'll talk about that in a bit. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. That will be coming up shortly. Another tease. Um, <laughs> okay. Another tease. Another tease. Um, right. So iOS 11, iOS 13, Apple included okay. this night mode for their new smartphones. Um, and it can do some pretty amazing things to enhance the look of low illumination photos. And when it senses a very dark scene, it automatically turns it on, which can sometimes be a drawback, but you can turn it off. 
fast. It seems to default to about three to five seconds when it's on, but you can, can increase the exposure length up to 30 seconds. So the picture of Orion that you see on the right-hand side there was one of these 30 seconds of exposures. Beautiful. And what it's doing, it's doing the high definition, uh, high dynamic range imaging. Uh, and so it's uh, making the, the bright part of the central nebula where the trapezium is, you know, it's, it's helping dim that down a little bit, but yet bringing out all the outer line fainter nebulosity. So it does a pretty amazing job. Yeah. Um, you can do sky astrophotography, but I've found it hasn't really performed as well as I thought it would on the Milky Way. Um, but hopefully that'll get better over time. But it really does nice pictures on the uh, the Ryan Nebula. Oh, yeah. So just briefly about the Spiral Cam app. Um, it has all these sliders to control all the exposure settings. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, it selects the registration stars for you, or you can tap on a star on the screen and it'll use that one. And as I mentioned, it tracks the object as the stars drift across the eyepiece field of view. If you have a tracking mount or an auto guiding mount, it'll do even better. Um, just pretty amazing app. Again, watch my website for the upcoming review. But here's a couple of examples just to tease you. This was M51 with an earlier version. As I give the developer comments, he keeps updating the app. Uh, so this was actually done with a little bit earlier version than what's out there now uh, of M51. But you can actually see more of the spiral arm structure. That's a little bit noisy picture. Uh, but again, it's capturing more of the spiral arm structure. So kind of cool. And this picture of the Pleiades was actually taken through that 102 millimeter out as untracked mount uh, that went on for several seconds. You know, the stars still look pretty good on Chris. So. Oh, God, you know. <laughs> Great. So here's a bunch of tips. I got a whole bunch of tips for everybody. So uh, if you... If you uh, to get started, uh, just, you can use the camera app self timer to allow a delay between you touching the screen and taking the picture. Uh, you can use this hat trick method if your camera app has a bulb setting where you're going to cover up uh, the camera or the aperture of the telescope with some uh, piece of cardboard or something. Uh, if you've got an iPhone, you can use the supplied earbuds as a volume control as a remote shutter release. That may work with some models of the oh. Android phones as well. But basically, you can start and stop uh, pictures, uh, the exposures, just using the, the iBuds, the volume control. If you do have an Apple Watch, um, you can start and stop the exposures with that. The dark picture that you see on the right-hand side of the screen is actually a live screen capture on the watch of what Nightcap camera was seeing through the telescope, and that's the Swan Nebula. Wow. So that, that big shutter button there, you can tap that to start and stop uh, the exposure right from your Apple Watch. And it's also just kind of neat to see the live view on your watch. <laughs> right. <laughs> if you have uh, a Bluetooth uh, remote shutter release, uh, there's lots of those available. You can uh, do that. Uh, there, that's a picture of the one from Phonescope there on the right. And the intent of all of these particular methods of starting and stopping is so that you don't create vibrations uh, by touching the screen to start and stop the picture. Mm -hmm. yeah. As I mentioned back at the beginning, getting the camera lens aligned over the eyepiece uh, can be a challenge. So if the moon or a bright open star cluster is in the sky, uh, use that. You can also point a flashlight into the telescope, uh, the aperture of the telescope, which will illuminate the eyepiece, eyepiece field of view, or remove the eyepiece from the telescope and with the camera attached, uh, point it at some sort of bright light. That's the picture you see there on the right. I'm actually aiming at the, uh, the red rope light in my observatory. Um, so it's illuminating the eyepiece field of view. So again, you can see where the eyepiece field of view is as far as where the camera is pointing. So that, that's a tip to help you get things aligned up. Bright objects like the moon, Venus, Jupiter may overexpose some of the camera apps. So you put a moon filter on or a polarizing filter like you see there on the right uh, to reduce the, the brightness of the object. If your camera app allows, do lock the focus once you have it in focus. Otherwise it may drift off on you. 
If your camera app allows, go ahead and manually adjust the exposures. And just like all, a lot of people do with astrophotography, bracket the images uh, using different exposures to see which ones are going to work out best on that object with your equipment. Place the camera lens at the same distance as the eyepiece eye relief. So if you have an eyepiece with a 20 millimeter or 12 millimeter uh, eye relief, that's roughly about the same distance that you want to have the camera lens at. That'll maximize the field of view as seen by the camera. Use low magnification to maximize faint object brightness. You can use higher magnifications on the globular clusters and the bright planetary nebulae. Keeping the rubber eyepiece eye cup attached can help uh, yeah. to prevent stray light coming into the camera lens if you're in a brighter area. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, some of the adapters may require that you actually have to remove the eye cup, so just mm -hmm. be aware of that. Mm -hmm. You can use digital zoom uh, for like a focal photography, but keep in mind that's just really magnifying the pixels. Uh, it's not really giving you a, like an optical zoom, but you can improve some of the images. And if you have a telephoto lens either built into the camera uh, or if you're doing sky photography, that can also help. Be certain your eyepiece is clean. This is probably the biggest bugaboo with doing uh, afocal uh, imaging. If you have a dirty eyepiece, like you see there on the right, you're going to get spots. Uh, you can actually see a very thin, faint crescent Venus there in the picture, uh, low magnification. Yeah. But um, you can also see all those dust spots on the eyepiece. So be certain you have a clean eyepiece. You do want to ensure that the adapter is tight on the eyepiece and that your phone is secure in the adapter. The alternative to doing that is be certain your iPhone is insured with your insurance company uh, <laughs> <laughs> because, because it's, they can't they can't like, fall off. <laughs> like a rubber mat underneath the telescope or something. You yep, know. yep, 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 yep. Yep, that has actually happened to me once. Um, I, I, the adapter slipped off of the eyepiece because uh, I was just a little bit sloppy trying to get something done very quickly. And the, I, the, the phone fell off down on the floor of my observatory. Fortunately, the, the floor of the observatory uh, is carpeted and with a very nice carpet inside, so nothing. there was no damage. <laughs> Do experiment, 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 and don't get frustrated with your initial attempts. Uh, this is easy. But, you know, the fainter stuff can be a bit of a challenge so you get used to doing it. Let's talk about editing real quick um, because that can bring in a couple of simple editing steps that can really bring out the best in your images. Um, and you can use apps uh, on your smartphone, your tablet, your Mac, or your Windows computer like Photoshop, GIMP, Lightroom, Photos, Graphic Converter, and a whole slew of other apps uh, to do this levels and sharpening adjustments on your pictures. Levels or stretching adjustments are used to enhance the contrast, brightness, and to bring out shadows, and it'll darken the sky background for you. Sharpening is used to make the picture look sharper, so it brings out more details, but do not over sharpen. That'll make it look ugly. So here are just some quick examples using the moon. So here's a raw picture, not raw, but a picture, the basic, the original picture of the moon um, with a couple of craters there in the, in the northern part of the moon. So, and over on the right hand side, you see the level screen for this particular photograph. And what we're going to do is down in that graph um, at the lower left hand corner, there's three little triangles one on the left, one in the middle, one on the right. We're going to adjust the right-hand slider triangle so that it just starts to touch that darkened in area in the graph. That's called the shoulder of the photograph. And so as you bring the slider in, which you can see on this picture, it's actually starting to brighten up the image. So I'll flip back. Here's the original. And then here's the brightened up image. A very simple adjustment that you can make to bring out a little bit more in your image, especially if it was slightly underexposed. This can help uh, correct for a little bit of underexposure. But then the next step is to sharpen it. And here's the, the dialogue to sharpen it. Uh, you can play with sliders and, and the various apps and see what amount of sharpness will work for you. But here is the you know, picture before sharpening and then the picture after sharpening. So do sharpen Let's your image. Let's do that one more time. Okay, so here is, you know, without sharpening, 
Okay. Yeah, we'll let that stay. Uh, so you can, if you know, if you look around at the craters there, you know, they look not quite as sharp as they do in this picture. That's true. So you can actually see a little bit of, of the terracing inside one of the craters. So now, before I let you go too much further, there was a question about just getting sharpest focus. Maybe that's something you're also covering later in the talk. The the uh, <clears throat> the the um, the basic technique there is to focus the image to your eye. If you wear glasses, uh, you need to have glasses to see sharply at infinity, um, wear your glasses to focus uh, the eyepiece. And then what you, when you put the uh, camera over the eyepiece and you start looking at the image on your screen, uh, if you want be certain your camera is now focused at infinity, if you do the digital zooming, on your camera app, so you can zoom in on the on the you know, crater on the moon or a star. Uh, you can tweak the image focus a little bit more, either with the knob on the telescope or with the uh, the phone's uh, focus adjustment. But yeah, zooming in can help a little bit. We certainly zoom back out to actually take the picture. If you have you know things like Lightroom and Photoshop, you can make a whole bunch of other. Uh, adjustments like noise reduction, adjusting the color, and of course you can stack or merge the pictures later on if you did a bunch of them. So just, you know, sort of getting summed up here uh, before we jump into a couple of little demos, uh, astrophotography has never been as easy or as it is as fun as it is today. Back in the old days or nights, you know, we used glass plates and film uh, or we take, you know, a few images each night. They didn't process those, hoping they got one or two good images. Right. With today, with the CCD imagers and our digital cameras, photographers take many images each night. They still throw out the bad ones, but they get many good ones. And with your latest iPhone or smartphone models, uh, which have these amazing cameras and some of the camera apps that really do extend the low light capabilities, uh, you can become a smartphone astrophotographer. So if you've got a smartphone, start doing some astrophotography. So, let's um, do some demos here. Okay. Da, 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 da. So, just real quickly, um, this is uh, the, the Mead smartphone adapter with three little bolts up there. Because the diameter of the clamp around the eyepiece is fixed, you, know, you can't use all eyepieces, but the small little 26 millimeter plosses that come with many of the telescopes, uh, they will fit very nicely in there, and you just tighten down the three screws to get that to mount. And then, of course, your iPhone, your smartphone would just go into the bracket here, put it in there, and center it up, get it all nicely locked in using the, the bolts on the back. So that's the mead one. I talked about um, the phone scope adapters and mentioned the business about the different cases. Uh, here are two different cases for, uh, from phone scope. And you notice this big disc here on the top. Yeah. This particular one is actually slideable. You can slide uh -huh. the disc here at the top to go over which of the lenses you want to use, uh, for a dual, uh, lens smartphone. The newer one, uh, it's not slidable, and it's actually fixed over the two power a telephoto lens. But this, again, just clamps around your phone. And the way it works is you have these kind of adapters. These are the adapters. Mm -hmm. They twist down. I don't know how well you can see it here, but you twist down, and these little fingers come in to clamp onto the eyepiece as oh. you twist it down. So it holds very securely to the eyepieces. Uh, again, there's a one and a quarter inch variety. There's a two inch variety, um, but doesn't fit all eyepieces. So here is one of my favorite eyepieces from <laughs> Scientific. It's the big. nine I mean, millimeter, 100 degree. I love this eyepiece. I bought it like seven years ago. Um, <laughs> and I really do love this eyepiece. Um, but it's big. It's big. So yeah, it's just gonna go on. Um, 
but it, it still will fit many, many of the two inch eyepieces. And of course, this one fits the one and quarter inch eyepieces. Yeah. So, and as I mentioned earlier, you don't have the optical alignment challenge. Yeah. Because the eyepiece is going to be perfectly aligned with your camera. Now, Mike, is that your favorite camera adapter out of all the different ones you've played with so far? Actually, actually, actually not. My favorite is the eleven hook adapter. That one, okay. which it is, it's a you know a simple adapter to use, and like I said, it went from all size eyepieces up to very large eyepieces. And you know, your smartphone is just going to go ahead and clamp in just like this, and then you tighten down the screw on the back and the side. And so now we have the foam very nicely secure. Now it's not going to fall out upside down. <laughs> yeah. And then to, to mount it over your eyepiece. So here I'm using that old three inch telescope that I got for Christmas in 1961. And this, you know, focus it, the object to your eye. Go ahead and put this over the eyepiece here. Oh, before I do that, let me show you the one other thing here. Almost forgot. Remote shutter release. Now, how does that work? <laughs> you just put it into you know, the headphone or the lightning connector on your on your phone. Okay. And the software detects that you're using the volume control uh, to do the triggering. So so the app uses that volume. The app uses that. Yeah, oh, I yeah. see. So, I see. So now you, know, you look at the screen on your phone, okay. get the eyepiece lined up with, with the camera, secure things down, and you're now ready to take a picture. <laughs> take a picture, you just you know press the volume control. Boom, you got a picture. Awesome. Or you start the exposure that may go for several minutes. So this 11-hook adapter, very, very – Flexible, fits almost every eyepiece you can think of, except for the very large wide angle ones. Um, one of the eyepieces that I use a lot for globular clusters is this 15 millimeter eyepiece from OPT, mm -hmm. which, let me take the bone out here temporarily. Yeah, I don't need that in there anymore. Mike, this is a great talk. It really is. I I, I'm actually very impressed. You've given us a ton of information. So yeah, we're we're wrapping up here. So you know, here's here's the 15 millimeter eyepiece on this 11 hook. Okay. Um, um, and I use a, a 30 millimeter eyepiece, which gives me nice wide angle, uh, low power for the galaxies, because uh, I want to get as much brightness out of the image as possible when you're doing paint stuff. So galaxies and nebulae using the uh, uh, low power eyepiece really helps. But if you're doing like crater photography or planetary photography, uh, you like I say, using I love using this nine millimeter eyepiece from Explorer Scientific. So here we are mounted on the Explorer Scientific. <laughs> so it can be done. <laughs> It can be done. So this is a very flexible adapter, and I really do like it. Um, once you get experience getting the, the camera lined up over the eyepiece, um, then you, you just move on. You, you don't have that problem anymore once you get used to doing it. So with that, uh, you see any more questions popping up? Well, let's see. Let's see what we have here. There was a question about using filters. You kind of covered that about uh exposure times have you tried using uh narrowband filters or h alpha filters or uh you won't get enough light um yeah. in those situations um i have used one of these atmospheric dispersion correctors uh for planets when they're low in the sky sure. uh, that can help uh sort of the moon filters or the polarizing filters to reduce the light uh for the moon or venus uh, or even jupiter can help but yeah using the dark sky filters or the light pollution filters nebula filters that's just going to reduce the light too much uh, and you, you're not going to get anything there right yeah um um will you have on your 
on the Mighty ETX, I assume you're going to put uh, some comments in the Mighty ETX website, correct? Uh, about uh, most of my stuff, uh, personal stuff, gets put up now um, and has been from since uh, back in the 2000s, middle 2000s, yeah. over my Cassiopeia Observatory website. So if people go there, that's where they'll see the reviews. And so let me make sure I have the right URL for that because I'm going to add it to the comments. And some people have asked for you to list all of those apps, you know, where they can just uh, click on them and, and go there. You know, so people that don't have iPhones, the Android guys, and and uh, I don't know if there's Windows software, but but uh, what is the URL for your Cassiopeia? So it's www.wiesner.com slash co. E-O. CO for Cassiopeia Observatory. Okay. So www.wiesner.com forward slash CO. That's it. Okay. And uh, here on the screen are the Android apps. Uh, there may be others. Uh, if you go look for astrophotography up on the Google Play Store, uh, you'll find a whole bunch of them. Uh, these were two that I found out that had the full exposure control and did do the image stacking on the device. Very cool. Just adding, and then uh, nightcap camera, or if people want to play with the spiral cam and milky cam or Saturn cam, um, those are free, uh, and you can have a lot of fun playing with those too. So that's wonderful. Okay, all right. Uh, well, uh, everybody that's watching right now, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for uh being here and spending your uh, your evening with uh, Mike Wiesner and myself. And um, uh, we will have uh, Mike on again, I'm sure, uh, talking about more of uh, his adventures and his insights on using telescope gear. Um, we have uh, more uh, uh, speakers coming up on our um, Explore Now series that's coming up next week. So stay tuned. Thanks for watching and keep looking up. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.